Today is March 19, 2016, and uh, let us start with prayer, and then we'll get into our investigation of the community rule. Heavenly Family, Toda, thank you so much. You have blessed us with a wonderful Sabbath, and um, you have blessed us with the principles by which we can investigate what we have before us tonight. Please guide us. Please help us to understand the truth. Help us to grasp all the lessons that you want us to grasp tonight. Bind us together in your love with each other and with yourselves. And uh, Heavenly Family, please just bring this meaning to be exactly what you want it to be for the sake of your kingdom. Let nothing hinder it. Thank you so very much. Bless us all and bless all the other branch candidates, wherever they are and whatever their situations may be. Thank you so much. We ask all these things, Vishen Semach, in the name of branch. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, since everyone on was basically on... Uh, in our other studies, at least some of our other studies dealing with the community rule, we won't go back and recap all of that again. Um, we can kind of go from where we left off last night. Um, and we didn't actually get into reading more of the verses related to the idea of God not heeding when some call on him, even though there are more verses for us to look at. So we ended up just discussing a number of different aspects of the community rule, specifically dealing with this paragraph on the curses that the Levites pronounced. And there's a lot of good there um, in our discussion concerning that. So if there are more aspects to be discussed that people want to mention, feel free to do so. And if no one has anything to discuss immediately on that, we can look at a few more of those verses and then we can uh, go on from there. So does anyone have any comments or questions on any of this? Okay. I guess we can read a few more of these verses then. Um, again, I'll kind of just briefly sketch what it is that we're talking about specifically here. Um, so we're looking at 1 QS, column 2, line 5, is about where this starts. And so this is the community rule, and we're looking at the um, covenant ceremony, entering into the covenant. And so far, there has been the priests and Levites blessing the God of salvation and all his faithfulness, and then the priests recited the favors of God, and then the Levites declared the iniquities of the children of Israel, and then those entering the covenant confessed their sins and acknowledged the mercy of God, following which the priests uh, were to pronounce a blessing on all the men of Lord God, and then the Levites pronounced a cursing, or pronounced a curse, on all the men of the lot of Belial. And that's this paragraph that we have been looking at. And the phrase in particular that we, um, especially last weekend, we were looking at the phrase, may God not heed when you call on him. We've been looking at that and we read a number of verses dealing with that um, and how, yes, there are plenty of verses actually within um, the various popular canons of scripture that different religious communities have that speak of that same idea. This is in the, the Hebrew Bible, otherwise known as the Old Testament. It's also in the New Testament, um, in the writings of Paul. We have it in the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of Luke, and a number of other places, um, also in James. So we've been looking at that. We haven't looked at all the verses yet, 
if I'm remembering correctly, the last one that we looked at was Isaiah 59, verse 2, but we may have actually looked further. Does anyone remember uh, what the most recent verse that we looked at was, or shall we pick up with Jeremiah 11:11? 11, 11? Trent, I don't remember where we were. However, are all these scriptures going to be in the next um, silver trumpet for us? Uh, no, they won't be. At least Is most likely any- not. Okay. Is there any way of you sending me all of those? Because I missed the meetings last weekend, so I missed all of that as well. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, I can do that. I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, so um, we may have already read this. I'm not remembering for sure, but we'll go back and read Jeremiah 11, verse 11, and go on from there. There aren't that many statements. And um, we'll have whatever discussion is necessary and beneficial to have in relation to these verses. But we have spent you know, all last weekend and last night discussing these things. And so I'm thinking that it's likely the case that many of these things or the principles that underlie these uh, statements have already been thrust out a lot. So it won't be surprising if we don't go through a whole lot on these particular aspects in this meeting, and then we can look at the next aspect. but anyway, Heavenly Family blessed us as we read these verses. In fact, I'll, I'll mention a few verses again, and then people can look them up and read them. So the first verse is Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 11, if someone could look that up. And if someone else could look up Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 12... And if another person could look up Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 18. I have that one. Awesome. And if someone else could get Micah chapter 3, verse 4. Okay, so whoever has Jeremiah 11, verse 11, would you like to read it? I have it. Okay. So I, the Lord, say this, I will soon bring disaster on them which they will not be able to escape. When they cry out to me for help, I will not listen to them. Okay, any comments on that? One of the things that stands out to me is how this is talking about disaster being brought on people and they're crying out for help and there will not be an answer. There will not be deliverance for them. So people can forfeit the blessing of rescue from our Heavenly Family. They can forfeit the blessing of being helped um, to get out out of their circumstances, out of their disaster. Um, That's the same sort of thing that we find here in the context of the community rule, where, again, what's happening to them? Well, they will be cursed because of their guilty wickedness. Um, They will be delivered up for torture at the hands of the vengeful avengers. And they will be um, visited with destruction by the hand of all the wreakers of revenge. You know, so this is judgment coming upon them. And anyone in judgment will cry out, to be delivered, and it's saying, I'm sorry, I can't deliver you from that. Um, Reminds me of the final destruction of the wicked after, after the thousand years and after the 100 years, even um, when they're resurrected for the final destruction. You know, there will be no answer to their cry. Yeah, there, there's no deliverance from that. And the fact of the matter, as we've gone through again, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 18. When Satan and his followers recognized how bad of a situation they were in, they called out, you know, they went weeping to God and asked to be brought back into the heavenly kingdom to take their former places or any place. But it was just because they recognized that they were in a bad situation. It wasn't because they had a, really had a change of heart. And without that change of heart, 
if they should have been or if they would have been delivered from their bad situation and allowed back into the heavenly kingdom, it would have brought the end of the heavenly kingdom, including themselves. So it wouldn't have even been for their own good for our heavenly family to allow them back in. It wouldn't have actually helped them. Sure, they wouldn't be in a bad situation anymore, but they would only end up in a worse situation. And so that's what we find many times where heaven cannot help those who have refused to live according to right principle. Kind of like, you know, if you have someone who's committed an awful crime and is put in jail and just, you know, pleads with the judge, please just, you know, just don't send me to jail, please. Well, if it's a just judge, the judge shouldn't hear that. The judge should say, no, sorry, I can't just let you free out to roam around people and you know, commit worse crimes for yourself and, you know, against others. Um, That would be entirely unjust. And so it's, you know, it's only because of misconceptions of the love, grace, and justice of God that people, um, including myself, have misunderstood (laughs) things like this, that God won't, answer certain prayers or hear certain calls for deliverance, but it's really the only right and just thing to do. And we recognize that in everyday life when it comes to certain circumstances. It's just we haven't thought to apply those same principles to God and what we read in Scripture. So if there are any other comments uh, on this, please do voice yourself and you can you know, make a comment or ask a question or whatever it may be. But we won't, we don't want to leave too many long pauses uh, between reading so that we can continue on. So if there are any other comments, you can voice it. If not, um, whoever has Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 12, please go ahead and read that. I have it. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Okay. Any comments on that? Sounds pretty straightforward. Indeed, yes. Pretty straightforward. Uh, It kind of reminds me of the passage that we read before in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15 where you know their offerings their sacrifices reaching out with their hands in prayer none of that could be heard none of it was acceptable because it had it was full of hypocrisy it had become a dry formalism with unrenewed hearts so here again if they fast I will not hear their cries for help even if they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings I will not accept them Same type of idea. Uh, If there are any other comments or questions on that passage, anyone can feel free to uh, make your comment or question known. And otherwise, whoever has Ezekiel 8, 18, uh, go ahead and read that. I have 8, 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury... Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Okay, so, yeah, with that one, we are all familiar with Ezekiel 9. Do not let your eyes spare, neither have pity. Um, I think that's in verse 5. That's something as Davidians that we're all familiar with. But here it attaches to that idea um, not listening. The way it puts it in the NET is when they have shouted in my ears, I will not listen to them. Again, why? Well, Ezekiel 8 verse 18 describes the utmost um, idolatry, hypocrisy, desecration um, on the part 
particularly of the leading men in the temple and how they, um, yeah, just were committing abominations in the eyes of God. So how could they be heard? Any other comments on that? Okay. Uh, whoever has Micah 3, 4. Uh, Micah 3, 4. Then shall they cry unto Yahweh, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Okay. Any comments on that? Well, I might just make a quick comment. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people, for some reason, they just believe, and, and many of us have, really, believed that any time you cry out to the Lord, no matter what you've done, what you're currently doing, he's just so kind and generous, he's going to always hear you. And all these verses show us that there is some point when, unless a, a person that's, done wrong is speaking in full repentance at the time. These verses prove to us, it just kind of proves that um, once saved, always saved is not true as well. But um, I think you all know what I'm talking about here. I mean, it's just that he doesn't always hear and won't always hear. But a lot of people believe that's not so. They believe any time. They're praying that their prayers are heard, and it's pretty serious to know that that's not the case in all in all cases. Yeah, absolutely. It is so serious and important to know. And, of course, then you have the statements from Ellen White in early writings, how people could be offering up prayers which they think are going to Jesus, but really they're going to Satan, and Satan is the one answering their prayers. Um, we talked about that a little bit before in a past meeting, but you know, Ellen White talks about that in early writings. And in somewhere else, she says that um, within the context of her talking about a doctrine of spurious holiness, she says that people will call Satan... Christ our righteousness unknowingly and yeah it's really incredibly serious she also says that some people some people's prayers or some prayers rise no higher than either I forget if she says the ceiling or their heads um, but it's certainly the case that there are many prayers that rise no higher than the heads of the people praying. I know that I've prayed many prayers that rose no higher than my own head. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's certainly important. I mean, people can say that, oh, you know, that's uh, discouraging or that is... Um, You know, people don't like the thought of that. <laughs> they just people just typically don't like the thought of that. So, people might not like talking about it or dwelling on it. But hey, if it's the truth, isn't it important to know? And isn't it actually for our benefit to know? And thus, we can learn to cry out in such a way that we be heard, rather than continuing on thinking that no matter what we do no matter what perspective we take, no matter how we pray, that it's all heard the same. And very important. You know, there's another thing that I used to wonder about for, well, there for a while, for quite a bit, and I can't say that I ever come to a, an answer, so maybe somebody has the answer. But if Satan and, you know, the other angels, they were such highly intelligent being. And so if he was so intelligent, couldn't he have known 
from the beginning, who he was, and the difference between him and Christ, wouldn't he have known that he couldn't win? And so why did he proceed? I mean, I've just never completely understood that. So I just wondered, has anyone else ever wondered about that? Trent and I have actually discussed it not that long ago. Yeah, um, I'll just say that I don't think that we have any reason to think that Lucifer had any thought that there was no possibility of him actually gaining the victory. Of course, the very fact that he did make war shows that he really did think that he could have the victory. Um, Just as no one sets out into uh, battle with no thought of benefit or victory or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it, he he knew who he was in in that at least as as much as anyone knows who they are. Um, he didn't at first know who Christ really was, but that was revealed. Uh, the Father was known to be the Most High God, but there would be no reason for Lucifer to think that it was impossible to defeat God. Um, Lucifer himself was quite majestic. So, yeah, he, he was high in his own estimation, and, you know, he was able to gather enough forces that by the time he decided to actually wage war in the heavens. Um, yeah, it looked like a reasonable possibility that that they would win. Well, the closest I've ever come to understanding it is um, we're told that at some point God will allow people to believe a lie. And so it's possible that he entertained his thoughts for so long and probably had already refused um, help from uh, the Almighty God or Christ, whoever came to talk him out of his wrong path. Maybe he was allowed to believe a lie to, to make him believe he could defeat God. Anyway, I don't dwell on it, uh, never have dwelt on it too much, but when I do, it's like I just go around in circles. It's like, would he have known better? So did he believe a lie because he chose to do wrong and not repent? You know, I think one reason why this is such a hard thing for us to really wrap our minds around is because we have grown up with the idea that the term omnipotent for God the Father or any of the members of the Godhead means something other than what it actually means. Just like we've thought that God was beyond space and time or, you know, able to create something out of nothing. And these are things that we don't really understand. In other words, the uh, omnipresence of God has been understood in a way that is very different from how reality actually is. And the omniscience of God has been understood in a way that is very different from how reality actually is. And just so the omnipotence of God has been understood in a way, I mean, it, it just goes to points of the ridiculous. You know, well, God can do anything, is, you know, is the thought, and that means that anything that is conceivable is possible for God to do. And that, that actually just doesn't make sense. Just because you can conceive of something does not mean that it's possible in any way. Um, so people pose such questions as, 
you know, can God make a rock so heavy that he can't lift it? And people spin around and around on that because, well, God is supposed to be omnipotent and so he's supposed to be able to do everything. So you'd have to say, well, yes, God can make a rock so heavy that he can't lift it. But then, oh, then he has a rock that he can't lift, but he can do anything, so he must be able to lift it. I mean, all that that shows is that omnipotence, if God is all-powerful, it is necessarily within certain limits or certain spheres because to say that someone could make a rock so heavy that they can't lift it and that, you know, you end up with a self-contradiction. You know, if God can do this, you know, and when you're posing someone as being able to do all things, you can't have them do something that causes them um, not to be able to do something without limiting their omnipotence. So it's, it's the type of thing that, yeah, uh, we shouldn't think that that there's something going on with God that's like just, yeah, has it so that absolutely no rules, not even the rules of consistency and truth and logic and reality apply to him. Um, as far as the whole aspect of Satan lying to himself, well, I'll say, yeah, he certainly lied to himself. He believed a lie from the very moment that he sinned. Mm-hmm. He believed a lie. And... You can say that God allowed it, but it's not like God has a specific moment where he wasn't allowing him to believe a lie, and then all of a sudden he's like, okay, I'll allow him or cause him to pass under some sort of delusion. No, all people have been allowed at all times to believe a lie, allowed in the sense that God isn't going to actively prevent them or make their minds unable to believe a lie. We all have the ability and uh, Lucifer always had the ability to believe a lie, and at a certain point, he did believe a lie, and then he just kept on carrying that through, and our Heavenly Family pled with him not to believe a lie from the time that he first manifested that he was believing a lie, um, but he just refused their pleadings continually and persistently, and that gave him a spirit of independence whereby he thought that he didn't uh, have to do anything that depended on God. Like, he, he could be independent of God, independent of heaven or our heavenly family, and yet um, continue on successfully. And as he did that, you know, he kept on with that mindset. It's, okay, well, if I can exist and continue on successfully without God and his family, then perhaps I can, you know, I can even just bring them to an end. And if I can continue on independently, then you have an independent rule, an independent government that can rival the other government. And so that's, that's kind of how that can can progress. And then at, that, at some point, the way Ellen White puts it in Spiritual Gifts is that it was agreed, there was a council that was met, and it was agreed that Lucifer and those who were following him had to leave heaven. And at that point is when they decided, no, war, it's time for war. And so that's, that's when war was declared and battle was fought. And eventually, who, we don't know, no one really knows how long it lasted, but eventually um, they were banished from that place. And they ended up here somehow. <laughs> so that started a whole other story. So anyways, I don't know if any of that was helpful, but I think sometimes just viewing things from slightly different angles can be helpful to get a clearer picture of the scenario. And it still maybe doesn't answer all the questions. Like, you know, there's still questions that we have. Oh, yeah. But 
at least we can start looking at it from a more realistic direction rather than you know kind of staying in the same mindset because I know for me I've had a lot of questions in the past and had no thought of any real answer because it all seemed too far out because my mind was steeped in immateriality. But since that's been um, stripping away that understanding of, of the falsehood of immateriality, I've been able to kind of reevaluate some things uh, that I've considered in the past. And, you know, some of the things I've been thinking about are quite uh, shocking to me or even confusing or um, disconcerting, but I'm just grateful for the process of coming at it from a framework of actual reality and it, rather than imposing certain things like, oh, well, that isn't even a possibility because of whatever reason, mm -hmm. you know, which isn't based upon reality. So I, I think that's, um, for myself at least, I can honestly say that's a big reason why I've had so much confusion on certain aspects of things. It's just because I wasn't even considering these other options because I had a preconceived idea of, of um, how things were. I'll just say that. Okay. Well, if there's no other comments on that aspect, uh, we do have some more verses to read on the issue of God not hearing when the quote-unquote they call on him. Just a few more verses, really, that I have written down on this aspect. Um, if someone could get Zechariah chapter 7, verse 13... And if someone else could get James chapter 4, verse 3. And if another person could get James chapter 5, verse 16. And those are the last three verses that I have here. Um, so whoever has Zechariah seven thirteen, if you could read it, that would be wonderful. I have it. Uh, therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed and they would not hear, so they called out and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, any comments? I guess that one's pretty straightforward. Um, whoever has James 4, 3, if you could read that. I have that one. You ask and do not receive because you ask a miss that you may spend it on your pleasures. That's a good one. Yeah. They've all comments? been pretty straightforward, but what did you say? Uh, I just said, do you have any more, like anything to expand on that as to what stood out to you as being good about it? Well, it was it was a little bit more comprehensive as far as the circumstances. And so for me, it just kind of, uh, I realized that my mind was narrowing in on the final end of something, even though that isn't necessarily the point of this statement in the community rule or even some of the verses that we've read. Some of them, I think, it was describing the end result. However, this is obviously um, speaking to people who are still in probationary time. They're not sealed for destruction necessarily. And it's just saying that God cannot answer a wrong request in any circumstance. Yeah. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. <laughs> you know, you ask wrongly and therefore you don't receive. That's, that is pretty simple and, and that kind of boils it down to, yeah, no matter what the circumstances are, if we're asking wrongly, we can't receive. 
Any other comments on that? Okay. Um, whoever has James 5.16, you can go ahead and read that. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Nope, next one, sorry. <laughs> Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Okay, so this one actually is showing contrast. It's the prayer of the righteous person that avails much. So we've seen a whole lot that says the prayer of the wicked essentially doesn't avail, but the prayer of the righteous does. And of course, we've seen that in other passages. But if it was the case that the prayer of everyone avails much, that if all prayers avail much, what is the point of specifying that the prayer of a righteous person avails much? Not much point. Yeah, there wouldn't be much point. Which actually... Um, this brings me to an, another aspect that I think is really important to talk about, just understanding prayer a little bit better. Um, and I'd like to just explain a few things about it, but um, it kind of departs from this particular verse. So I just wanted to ask before I uh, express a few things about prayer, if anyone else had any comments or questions about this verse. Okay, so Heavenly Family, please help me to be able to express this clearly and accurately. Okay, so this whole thing of prayer, um, there are so many aspects to this, and we've talked about some of this in the past, um, perhaps not with everyone here. This was, I think, even a couple years ago now that we the question of what I'll refer to as uh, exclusively mental prayer or merely mental prayer, that came up. Um, now there's, again, like I'm saying, there's a lot of aspects to this. Um, the idea of mental prayer is one aspect, and I'll briefly mention what we discussed in the past. Um, so often people will pray and will pray just in their minds without actually saying anything audibly. And what we saw is that Scripture simply does not teach for us to pray like that. There's actually nowhere in Scripture uh, that teaches silent prayer in the sense of merely mental prayer. There is one example of silent prayer in Scripture, and it is um, Hannah in the temple. She, and the way it describes it in Samuel, and Ellen White talks about this too, she prayed, and she was just so distraught, she couldn't cause a sound to escape her lips, so she only mouthed the words. So she's actually mouthing the words, rather than just thinking in her head, mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, it was technically silent. It was inaudible, unless there was a, the faintest whisper, but even that I'm not sure. But even then, though, she was mouthing the words. So it wasn't merely mental. It was really communicating as we typically do in life. You know, we, when we talk to others, we speak. Um, all throughout Scripture, you know, when people pray, it's very very few times that it actually says, and they prayed, and then it just says what they were thinking, or, or in fact, there's no times that it says what they were thinking, but it very few times does it say, and, and he prayed, or and they prayed, and then just gives the content of the prayer. Typically, when it records a prayer, it says, and he said, or they said, or she said. Or they cried out. Or they, yeah, they cried out, or cried aloud even. Um, when David says, you know, I will pray in the morning, I will lift my voice unto you, like all throughout Scripture, 
Prayer is very clearly an audible experience. And so, you know, the conclusion that we have come to is that if we have no scriptural precedent for merely mental prayer, and we have, uh, you know, overwhelming evidence for audible prayer, then we should pray audibly. And that's, you know, ever since this came up, or since I learned about this, um, and Doug talked about it too a little bit. He didn't really go into it, but I remember, and it might have even just been a private discussion with him, I'm not remembering exactly, but I remember talking to him and he mentioned how um, among branches, at least some, had come to understand that prayer scripturally is an audible experience. Um, So since learning of that, I stopped to pray inaudibly because I recognize that's not a scriptural uh, prayer. And so that, that kind of changed things in my mind of, okay, what exactly is prayer? How does it work? And by this, it highlights a difference in how we typically think of prayer and how prayer is in Scripture. And I want to expand on this more beyond just the idea of mental prayer versus audible prayer. So here's the thing. So often we think of prayer as something that it is not. And in fact, um, the activity that people usually refer to when they use the word prayer is something entirely foreign to the true religion of Scripture. I'll mention that again because I think it's really important to sink into this. The practice that people usually refer to when they use words like prayer is something entirely foreign to the true religion of Scripture. So, here's the thing. People usually think of prayer as some sort of, something more reminiscent of meditation, or even more specifically, something more akin to telepathy. Just communicating just purely by thought. Um, which again, that's just, it's just not in Scripture. People also view prayer as being inherently effective. That, you know, people use the phrase, prayer works, which can be used within a right context, that phrase, but it is often used to convey a wrong idea, where people often view prayer as itself accomplishing something. There's some sort of spiritual power, mysterious power inherent in prayer. And there's been people um, who have actually done what they refer to as experiments or, you know, it's, it's really pseudoscience, but there are people who have done whatever they have done, testing things, trying to detect certain uh, energies or whatever the case may be when people pray and say that they've discovered these things um, and that it's really causing the world around us to change. You know, prayer causes the world to change in some fundamental way just by the act of praying. And these people have shown, supposedly, that that is the case, whether it's a Jew praying to Adonai, to Hashem, Yahweh, whether it's a Christian praying to Jesus or the Trinity, whether it's a Muslim praying to Allah, whether it's a Hindu praying to Krishna or any other deity, whether it's um, 
a Buddhist meditating or praying to the, you know, whatever essence they pray to, although not all Buddhists are even theistic, but some are. Um, and, the, you know, this apparently works no matter what, because, hey, it's this spiritual activity. It's this spiritual exercise that people are engaged in. Um, all of that, everything that I've just mentioned, is foreign to Scripture and is foreign to reality. Um, and we so often have worked within that sort of framework, even if we haven't gone all the way in thinking uh, overtly about certain of those aspects, even if we haven't uh, been aware of what certain people propose as to the effectiveness of prayer, and we haven't really thought it out, we've still operated within certain um, assumptions about prayer and what it is, what it does, how we ought to do it, and all of this. Um, really, in Scripture, what you find is that people call out to God. Most often, it's not called prayer. Prayer is just to ask. There are times when people call out to God in order to ask God something. There are times when people call out to God for another reason, uh, to intercede for someone else or to seek counsel or guidance or whatever the case may be. There's many things... Or even just for Thanksgiving. Yeah, or for Thanksgiving. Absolutely. So people call out to God for different things. And angels hear that call and they bring those prayers to God. And it's not necessarily even the case that every individual thing is, you know, like an audio recording and then that's taken up and God has to sit there all day listening to audio recordings. No, it's things are uh, put in a more condensed form, the way it's presented in, in Scripture, where angels take uh, prayers to heaven and then you have... Um, you know, in Revelation, for instance, you have um, the angel at the altar offering incense in Revelation 8, and the incense is the prayers of the saints. Okay, so there you have the presentation of prayer. You know, Christ is the one who stands before the Father and presents the requests, the supplications, and some angels evidently bring it to Christ, and other angels probably bring it to those angels, and it's, you know... There's a real system that is in place, a real system underway um, that isn't something of us just merely in our minds thinking all these thoughts and expecting um, a being to be constantly reading our thoughts and putting thoughts back in our thoughts you know, and all these different things. So that whole idea of prayer is erroneous. The scriptural idea of prayer, and all, even the word prayer isn't even the best word. I mean, it conveys the wrong thoughts. If, if today, in the branch message, we were to have a translation of the standard Bible or of any of these other texts, we wouldn't use the word prayer within that translation because it conveys the wrong thoughts. And again, most of the time, even when someone calls out to God in even our regular translations, it doesn't call it prayer. And they just call out. And that's, that's what happens. It's actually quite a simple thing. It's a very, you know, it's within the realm of what is real, just as we might call out to someone else. And that's, that's the way it is in Scripture. So I hope that, that helps to demystify how we have viewed prayer. And I know this is kind of an aside from what we're looking at in the community rule, but just reading all these verses of people crying out and all these different things, um, the effectual 
prayer of a righteous man avails much. I think it's very helpful to view these things within the right context rather than imposing other things upon them. Uh, This other type of quote-unquote prayer that most of the religious world is engaged in did not have its roots in the Hebrew religion. Rather, it had its roots, once again, in Greek philosophy, where, you know, Plato, his idea was that what is truly real is ideas. Ideas are the things which are truly real. And, therefore, God really, his reality is an idea. It's it's an immaterial, independent thing, and that God is so transcendent and above all and beyond all. And so that kind of transcendentalism is what brought about the idea of, well, then we, instead of using the material mouths that we have, we shouldn't use them. We just need to be engaging with this transcendent world, this world above matter, because they viewed our minds as being outside of matter and beyond matter. So we would just uh, speak to the divine and ask the divine through our minds. In the ancient world, at first, for hundreds of years, that was looked, you know, someone praying merely in their heads was looked upon as wickedness. This is not only by Jews, but also by pagans. It was looked upon as someone as, you know, basically wishing death upon others and, you know, all these awful things because um, if they, basically the idea was if they weren't entirely perverted in their their prayers, the, there would be nothing preventing them from speaking them out loud. They would have nothing to hide. They would have nothing to hide, exactly. So that's kind of how that whole thing started and that type of prayer has influenced the whole religious world, to my knowledge, by now. Certainly, the three um, dominant monotheistic, or supposed to be monotheistic religions, and it's influenced myself, unfortunately. So, anyway, um, are there any comments or questions on this aspect of things? I have one. Um, occasionally I have read in the scriptures where it will say something like, and I said in my heart. So what is the difference of saying something in your heart, to me that's inaudible, versus praying out loud? Are you aware of anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. There's actually many places in scripture that talk about, I said in my heart. But the thing is, it's not saying anything to God. It's talking within ourselves. It's just thinking. In other words, uh, ancient Jews and other people in the ancient Near East viewed the heart as the seat of thought. They thought that our heart was where thinking happens. They didn't realize that our brains were responsible for thinking. Um, They didn't actually know what the brain did at all. So they, they had this idea that that's our heart. Our our heart is where we think. So they would say things like, you know, so I said in my heart, that's just saying, I said in my mind, or I said in my thinking. And they're, when they say that, they're typically expressing the thought that it's something that they're not saying out loud. Um, But it's not that that's a prayer. They're just thinking to themselves. Thank you. Sure, not a problem. Um, I have a question sort of along the lines that uh, Rebecca just mentioned, but um, you know, Psalm 139 says, search me, God, and know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Um, you know, it's just, again, kind of, whatever you search me, O Lord, and you know me. Um, you know, is he, you know, because I've obviously been affected by that thinking as well with prayer for 50 years, um, but that there seems to be also in Scripture a sense of, of, you know, knowing us and knowing our hearts and judging our hearts. So how would God be able to judge my heart if he didn't know my inward thoughts? You know what I mean? Sure. Okay, so here's the thing. 
in what we're saying, we're not even saying that God can't read someone's thoughts. Um, we're not saying that that's something that can't be done or anything like that, but we're, we are saying that prayer isn't that in Scripture. That there's nowhere in Scripture that even implies that prayer includes that or is anything like that. And even the places that talk about God knowing someone's heart, um, most often is more general than what we would think of as mind reading. It's more often like other people can know other people's hearts. They can know other people's way of thinking, their intentions, their motives, all of that. There's places in Scripture that show people knowing other people's hearts like that, and it's talking about um, an intimate acquaintance with who that person is and how they function. Um, so that, that doesn't necessitate mind reading. However, again, I'm not saying that it's impossible. I mean, even today, um, there are ways that people hook up um, by attaching electrodes to their brains and so on, where people can actually, uh, people who are paralyzed can actually type on computers just by thinking the letters and the words, and the computer will type it out without them having to use their hands. Um, or they can do other things like that. Uh, more recently even, scientists have been able to figure out a way to, you know, how basically um, when we sleep, we dream and we picture within our minds all this incredible stuff. You know, we visualize it just within our conceptions. Well, scientists have begun to be able to actually take people's conceptions and their mental imaging processes and portray it on a screen. They've been able to actually take it and so you can actually see. Um, it's not perfectly clear, like the technology is not that good yet, but mm -hmm. it's it, good enough that you can really get the idea of what's happening in the dream. Yeah, I mean you could see people there, like at least in silhouette and you know vague color and all of that, you know that's that's actually possible even with modern technology, although it's far from perfect. And so if if that's possible, <laughs> you know, by I, us, yeah, by us, I I would certainly think that it's possible, um, you know, by more intelligent beings. Though again, it's not. Um, to say that that's what's happening all the time. And it's definitely not what Scripture is claiming is happening all the time. So does that help? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, I learned, uh, you, I, maybe I listened to something on YouTube um, where you talked that a, a year or so ago, and that was very, very helpful, very interesting. Actually, our pastor, Jim um, Howard, he used to teach us to pray audibly. He did. Um, and, uh, but there was just one other thing. We were, me and Ed and Rachel are here, and we were talking um, before all of us were Seventh-day Adventists, uh, the movie um, Bruce Almighty came out. I don't know if any of you remember that or if anyone saw it, starring Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. And um, are you familiar with that movie? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay. It's just, it's just kind of funny where um, Ed was saying that, all you know, all the prayers were coming to Jim Carrey because he was he wanted to be God. So Morgan Freeman let him be God, and then he's got a million prayers coming into his email, and he just answers yes to all of them, just yes, and hit return. And then it just causes like massive pandemonium, kind of going to the um, you know that God doesn't hear every prayer, that He wouldn't answer yes to every prayer. How ludicrous that would be to answer yes to every prayer. Prayer would just be utter chaos. You know what I mean? It just is is. A, a ludicrous thought. Just interesting. Absolutely, yeah. No, actually, that's that's a good point. Um, I totally forgot about that. But yeah, that does illustrate right there how yeah it would be totally insane for God to say yes to every prayer. Um, and yeah, that does show you know how what it would be like if prayer was how people typically think it is. You know. 
of what, how do you deal with all of these constant prayers, you know, hearing voices in your head all the time. And um, by the way, Christina, did you have something you wanted to say? I just noticed that you had come off mute a couple times as well. I, yeah, I just um, wanted to mention that I was really thankful for that clarification on the, and I think the word used as like a telepathy um, really helped to identify the immateriality related to the concept of just praying mentally. And then the aspect of having the messengers deliver the prayer um, also made more of a, you know, materiality made sense piece. So I was really thankful for that because if anything, it always continues to encourage me to pray audibly and then um, as we're instructed, you know, to go to a closet or so forth for those prayers and not um, be tempted to just pray in your head. I just have to say amen to that. I mean, that and what you said there about going to a closet, that reminded me, um, James White actually wrote an article on that about praying in your closet, and he was showing how, look, praying in a private place is actually what the scriptures are referring to. It's not talking about just praying in your head. It's about actually going somewhere and to pray privately, which actually assumes that you're going to be praying out loud, because otherwise you could just pray in your head. Um, so that's an excellent article. Uh, in regard to the other aspect of the, the, you know, messengers taking our prayers and so on, this reminds me of another statement by Ellen White. Uh, this is in a number of places, but maybe the most common place, the book that people have the most, is in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 158. Paragraph 1, and Ellen White here says, I call upon the ministers of Christ to press home upon the understanding of all who come within the reach of their voice the truth of the ministration of angels. I thought that such a profound statement where Ellen White has just emphasized she calls upon the ministers of Christ to press home the truth of the ministration of angels upon the understanding of all who come within the reach of their voice. I mean, what a statement. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very important. And this actually brings in another aspect. You know, in Daniel, you have Daniel praying, and Gabriel comes to answer, but Gabriel is held up for three weeks. 21 days held up before getting there. That uh, shows, again, the reality of prayer and answering prayer and how it actually works, rather than what I will call a more superstitious view of prayer. And this actually, um, the way that we've often viewed prayer is actually quite superstitious, where we will, it's kind of like... Um, what we often do when we think of prayer and the way that we typically think that prayer works is we will ask for things and the things that happen the way that we thought to, we will think, well, it worked. And then all the things that don't happen, we just don't think of those things. We ignore those things. And then we basically continue on praying and just, it's called confirmation bias, where we, we pray and then we think that it is effective when things happen in harmony with that prayer and then when things don't happen with our prayer, we disregard it and we just don't think of it. So confirmation bias is just when you, you have a conclusion that you're looking for and you accept everything that comes in confirmation of that idea and you ignore everything that would be disconfirming. Um, this is kind of like the same thing that you find with reading horoscopes, you know, where people will read it and, okay, well, 
this is what's supposed to happen. And anything, you know, people who believe in horoscopes, what happens is anything that happens in line with the horoscope, that's what they remember. And it confirms it for them, like, oh, yeah, this is it. And that anything that would, you know, disconfirm the veracity of reading horoscopes, that part is forgotten. That part is ignored. And, you know, approaching it from a more critical standpoint, you'd have to say, okay, you know, it's that, you know, the majority of horoscope readings don't actually uh, apply <laughs> as it should if it actually was a real phenomenon. Or at least, at, or I should say at best, it's 50-50. And that's the truth when it comes to prayer as well in the way that people typically think of prayer. The transcendental meditation type prayer or the the telepathic type of prayer is the same sort of thing. And, you know, it's kind of like people will think, oh, well, um, what about this prayer? What about that prayer? And then people, people end up thinking things like, you know, if something really tragic happened and people were praying and their prayer wasn't answered, people will think, well, God must have just had a, a better plan for them, you know, even if they were, you know, raped and tortured and ended up dead. Um, well, you know what? The fact of the matter is that there's real tragedy in the world. Tragic things happen. Awful things happen. That is entirely contrary to the will of our Heavenly Family. And in circumstances, in some circumstances, it's just the case, so sadly, that our Heavenly Family couldn't intervene. You know? I mean, it's... When people are in the dominion of darkness and in the dominion of wicked gods and, you know, bad things are going to happen. Our Heavenly Family doesn't want it to happen, but when people willingly turn away from truth, they're forfeiting, just as we've been reading in all these places, they're forfeiting the deliverance that otherwise could have been available to them. So there's, there's plenty of awful things that happen in the world, and it's not always the case that God just had a better plan for that person. Um, you know, the same thing happens when people... Um, in certain circumstances, when people are disobedient to the laws of health, let's say, and then pray and pray, and then they still end up with their, their illness or they still end up passing away, let's say. Well, it's not, you know, just that God decided, well, I'm just, you know, I have a better plan for them or, or whatever the case may be. It's, hey, you know, yeah, they're breaking laws of health. They have to deal with the consequences of that. And unless they're willing to change, how can they have any blessing from God in regard to their health if they're just going to continue on damaging themselves? Um, so, yeah, we have to get away from a kind of superstitious view of prayer. Any other comments? I had um, just one more comment about um, audible prayer in the Bible. And you may have mentioned this before, I don't know. But um, Daniel, you know, with Daniel in the lion's den when, uh, you know, the, um, whatever, the magistrates were trying to get Daniel and they knew they couldn't get him, you know, on any sin. And so they were like, oh, he prays to his God, obviously at the appointed times, which is interesting. And then um, the only way they could have arrested him for praying not to King Darius is if he was praying out loud because if he was praying in his head, then how could they have proved that he was breaking the law of, of King Darius, you know what I mean? And to be a thorn of the lion's den. So he had to be praying out loud so they could have arrested him, you know? Absolutely. That's an excellent example. Amen. So can Satan put thoughts in our minds? 
I guess it depends what you mean by that. <laughs> I, I well, think it really depends what you mean. I've always heard, in fact, um, back when I used to pray silently, I prayed silently a lot of times because I didn't want Satan to know um, what I was prayed about. I thought that was secret from him if I prayed in my mind. Um, but then I've also heard that, um, well, that thought comes from Satan or whatever. So, um, and have you ever just had a thought come into your mind out of the blue? You're not thinking, you might just be looking at a flower or something and a thought comes in your mind and you think, where'd that come from? And and it wasn't a good thought. Maybe it was something from years ago or whatever. So right. does that so, thought yeah. come from Satan? Is that just reality of, of that we have memories in our mind? or uh, I don't know. Okay, I'm just so asking. There's multiple ways to look at this. And that's why I was asking. It depends what you mean. Um, and first, actually, I'll address the idea of not praying out loud, uh, you know, from the thought that the devil will hear. Well, first of all, that's, it's not a scriptural idea because, of course, in scripture, the example is to pray out loud. Second of all, it kind of assumes that the devil is always listening to everything we say or that demons or fallen angels or whatever are always listening or able to listen when that isn't necessarily the case. I mean, there's the secret counsel of God and certainly... Um, our Heavenly Family is able to put people in a place where there's no uh, fallen angels to hear them or, you know, to drive away the forces of darkness so that they're out of range. Certainly all of that is certainly possible, um, which wouldn't necessitate praying merely within our minds in order for the devil not to hear us. And even if the devil was permitted to hear us at certain points, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's not always the case that it would be bad for us to be heard if our Heavenly Family should so permit. Um, and then there, there's the other aspect of, okay, what about the idea of thoughts from the enemy? First, I'll just say, yes, we can have thoughts that are from the enemy. But that doesn't express the mechanism by which those thoughts arise in our minds. That just explains their ultimate origin. But those thoughts could enter our minds in many different ways. Um, one thing is the power of suggestion. You know, people suggest things to each other in very subtle ways, very subtle ways, all the time, um, to the point where people might not even realize that they are having something suggested to them, and they might not even realize sometimes that they are suggesting something to someone else. It's extremely subtle. And certainly, anyone who has lived for however long, you know, the longer you live, the more you pick up on subtleties, and the better you become at dealing with subtleties. So certainly, Lucifer and the fallen angels would be masters of subtlety and masters of suggestion. Um, also, a way to, you know, for the devil to plant thoughts in our minds, so to speak, would just be other things earlier in our life. You know, other things that are there that are in our memories that will just end up coming to mind in some way, even if we don't remember why it's coming to our, our mind or how it got there in the first place. But it could just be something from our distant past, from childhood or whatever, um, that took place that arises in our minds in certain circumstances. Even, you know, smells trigger memories amazingly, far distant memories. Um, anything can, can trigger a memory or a thought or a way of thinking, and it, it's extremely subtle. It can be suggestion there in the moment, or it could be something from the past that has caused us to think a certain way, and then we think that way, and ultimately it has its origin with the, the Prince of Darkness. Um, whether there are other ways... Um, 
people in, in just speaking lies. Someone speaking a lie plants a thought from the enemy to someone else. It provides a temptation from the enemy for someone else. Um, there's also, there may be other ways, too, that are more, um, you know, require some sort of more high-tech something. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, there's speakers now that people can use, and they literally can point a speaker to someone in a crowd and shoot sound waves just at that person's ear and nowhere else. And no one else hears it, but that person hears it. You know, that's something that's a bit more direct. And when they hear it, too, it's different. You know, there's, well, okay, actually, there's, there's multiple ways. You can do it with sound waves, but then there's also things that people have, um, there's a technology that people have now where you can have this thing that rests on your ear and there's a little tiny thing that touches the back of your ear and vibrates. And it vibrates in such a way that mimics sound waves. And so you think that you hear things when you don't actually hear it. There's no sound waves involved. It's just simply the slight vibration of this little thing on the back of your ear, and it can play music to you, it can do all these other things. Um, you know, those are kind of more high-tech ways of doing things. Um, and there may be other ways, but I would say for the most part, that would probably be unnecessary, something like that. Um, suggestion is powerful enough. Memory is powerful enough. And then we also have the wickedness of our own hearts. You know, Elamite talks about that, how, you know, temptations from the enemy and the wickedness of our own hearts. Um, so we have all, all these different things that doesn't require anything, you know, interdimensional or immaterial or anything like that. So the, so the best thing to do, um, I would think, if um, a thought comes to your mind that shouldn't be there, is just to say, oh, that's not a good thought. I'm not going to entertain it or reach out and ask, you know, for strength to to get rid of that thought. And isn't, isn't that the right thing to do then? Yeah, I mean, regardless of the mechanism of how it got there. I mean, that doesn't really matter yeah. in terms of dealing with it. It's just, if there's something that's not true, if there's something that's not according to right principle, and it's a thought that arises in our minds from whatever means, then we ought to reject it. And we ought to just call out to our Heavenly Family to deliver us from it, to not give in to it, to not take it as our own. Um, and what that means, to take it as our own, would be to you know, let it stay there, <laughs> to dwell on it, to allow it to uh, affect your way of thinking and your decisions and all of that. But if you say, no, I'm not going to allow that to choose for me and I'm going to reject that thought. Now, to reject the thought doesn't just mean to acknowledge that it's bad. Because you can acknowledge that a thought is bad and then just let it hang around and still uh, have it in your mind. No. When you recognize a thought that is clearly against principle, or even if it's not clear at first, but if you find out that, yes, this is against principle, and if there's something that you're not sure about, then seek out the truth. Find out if it is a lie. And if there's any lie in your mind, then you must reject it. And what that means is to expose it by means of the truth, and to not allow it to remain in your thinking. To push it out with the truth. To just declare the truth and to emphasize the truth within your own thinking or audibly at the same time, you know, depending on whatever the circumstance is. But just to have the truth become the dominant thing and to allow the lie to be revealed in its true ridiculousness. Now, what I mean by this is every lie 
has no foundation in the truth. Sure, the devil can mix a lie with the truth, but you have to separate that out. Keep the truth and then take the lie, understand it for what it is, and recognize so much how it has no foundation in reality. And once you recognize that, it loses its power. It's like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, that's not even tangible. That's not even realistic at all. It's just ridiculous. That thought is not at all true. And then, you know, have it there. And then it's gone. It's, it's gone from you and don't recall it to mind anymore. No use in doing that. If it gets brought to your mind again, think on something else. Think about the truth. Oh, I have some questions. Sure. So I'm not sure this is like a personal thing or a community rule or the, or um, anything. Um, so when we pray, we, we pray like to the Lord because it's the, um, the heavenly sanctuary. So um, when I'm at, if I'm at church or any, I mean a church and the congregation, then we are facing to the, the stage is the south. Then um, I guess I'm supposed to face into the north because if I'm, I know that the other way is not north. That kind of like praying to the maybe like hidden. So that's one thing. Another question is, um, are we supposed to pray right away at the appointed time? Like so, let's say like three o'clock. Oh, this is more just like relationship with the heavenly family or the community world. Well, that's why. And the third question is, oh, um, are, are we praying supposed to like hide in the closet, just a perfect place? What if I, we are at work? So is the point of time there, am I supposed to just pray in my office, like raise my hand and, and to the north, and then my coworker would do that? <laughs> so that's it. Okay, hey, those are all very good questions. Thank you, Heavenly Family. I, I, I just wanted to say, too, before getting into the answers, those are excellent questions because those are the things that we need to know in just dealing with our practical everyday life. So first, uh, praying toward the north. Yeah, absolutely. The scriptural teaching is to pray toward the sanctuary. The sanctuary resides toward the north. That's a very general direction. I don't know you know, specifically where in the universe uh, this is, but north is always in the same general direction uh, as opposed to, you know, east or west. South, of course, is also pointing in the same direction, but just in the opposite direction from where the throne is. Um, So here's the thing. Yeah, in in church or whatever, uh, I'll just mention for me, in different churches, I'll, if I know where North is, and if I don't, I'll try to find out. Um, and, yeah, I'll, I'll pray to the North. And, hey, if people are facing another direction, it typically won't bother people if you pray in the opposite direction even. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just want to mention, yeah, think about it. If, if you're facing the podium and that makes you face south, all you have to do is turn around and have your, say, rest your elbows on the seat of your chair or pew or wherever, and nobody's going to think anything about that. Or raise your hands, even. Or raise your hands. Yeah, whatever. I just mean turning that direction. Yeah, my mentioning the elbows on the seat was not really um, specific to the purpose. But, yeah, raising your hands, although, as I understand it, it's only when we ourselves are speaking that it really is um, like more important, I guess, if you will, to raise your hands. If someone else is praying, there's not necessarily a precedent for raising your hands. You can if there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not like you need to feel like, oh, I'm not doing something right if I'm not raising my hands while someone else is praying. Yeah, there are scriptural examples, and Doug wrote a little study called Lifting Hands in Prayer, in which he goes through those examples and shows how 
Yes, there are times, like at the dedication of Solomon's temple, where Solomon is praying. He's the one who's speaking. He's raising his hands, and no one else is. They're all there, and they're participating in the consecration of the temple or witnessing it or whatever, but they're not raising their hands. So if the pastor's praying, it's not like you have to raise your hands, but certainly faith in the north would be good. And go ahead. Yeah, and even if the podium would be facing east or west, Another really simple solution, you just kneel sideways in front of your seat. And again, most people aren't going to think anything about it. They're, I mean, I've seen other people do it just for convenience sake, not having anything to do with facing any particular direction. And yeah, and, so it's easy to do. And even if someone does notice it, oh, that's different. That's just an opportunity to Absolutely. witness. Absolutely. But yeah, the idea is... When we talk to people, we face them. That's typically the way it is. Sure, there's times when we might be doing something and we talk to someone and we're not facing them. And the same stands true with our Heavenly Family. There's times where we might be doing something and we, we can call out to them and we might be doing something where we can't stop and kneel down or raise our hands or face north or whatever. We're just in the middle of doing what we're doing and we need to call out to them. Or there's times where we might uh, be in a circumstance where we can't say something out audibly, but we can mouth something or whisper something. Um, so, yeah, it, it depends on our circumstances for sure. Um, the times of prayer are certainly just that. They're times of prayer. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to pray at any other time. We can pray at any time, but there are times that are appointed for prayer. And the third hour and the ninth hour of the day are times of prayer and sacrifice in the typical system. And what we've learned in the antitypical system is that the sacrifice has been replaced by the suppers of the Lord. And so they are included within those third and ninth hours. Um, and, yeah, basically we have actually in Scripture there are actually seven primary times of prayer each day with a hidden eighth. <laughs> There's a midnight prayer, um, which to my knowledge doesn't require getting up every single midnight and praying. To my knowledge, hey, if our Heavenly Family shows us something other on that, then hey, they will, but... But there are seven times, you know, upon rising, and these are all pointed out in different places in Scripture. Upon rising, then at sunrise, then at the third hour, then at noon, and then at the and ninth that, hour. And that's not 12 o'clock, our time. It's just the sixth hour of the natural day. Just like the third hour isn't 3 o'clock in the morning, the third hour is the third hour from the rising of the sun. Um, so after the noon prayer, there's the ninth hour. And then there's when the sun goes down is also a time of prayer. And then there's on retiring to go to sleep. Those are the seven times of prayer. And then there's also the midnight prayer. Um, all of those times are appointed by our Heavenly Family and... Those are times to pray, and we should all pray at those times. Um, but it's not restricted to those times. Also, I'll mention that the only ones that we know for sure are for the duration of a whole hour are the third and ninth hours. Those are times, those are more than just times of prayer. They are times of prayer, but they're more than that as well. And so, for instance, um, I don't know of anything which would suggest that upon waking in the morning, it's required to pray for an hour. And then when the sun rises, to pray for a whole another hour. And then at the third hour, at noon, at the ninth hour, at, you know, sunset, upon going to bed, there's nothing that we know of which would suggest that we, all of those times of prayer last for the entire hour. Um, the third and ninth hour, the entire hour in both those instances is set aside as holy to our Heavenly Family 
there are appointed times of prayer, of worship, of suppers of the Lord. And, um, yeah, so those are all uh, those aspects. As far as hiding in the closet, I think we've already kind of touched that, how, yeah, you can be in any circumstance, and if you need to call out to our Heavenly Family, feel free to, uh, even if you're doing something like, you know, when Teresa and I have had to drive a lot. Well, while we're driving, it's totally within what is right to do to talk to our Heavenly Family as we're talking to each other and driving. Uh, And it's not necessarily that we have to stop every time we want to say something to them. However, there are plenty of times in life where we're doing things and it's good for us to stop to kneel down and raise our hands to heaven and call out to God. There's many times when I'm writing where I'll stop and I'll kneel down, raise my hands to heaven and ask our Heavenly Family for guidance. And, you know, so that's entirely uh, within their will. So I hope that that's all clear on all those aspects. Does that help? Uh, yeah, so we, um, the appointed time or the seven time player, then we play, the, I mean, six, okay, five times. So at least we play at the, right at the clock, right? So it's like three o'clock is the appointed time. Then we, we just need to do it at three instead of like three ten or three fifteen. Okay. Right, okay, so. Uh, I'll, on that aspect, I'll mention a couple things. It is good for us to be timely. So when sunrise happens, we should pray as the sun is rising. When sunset happens, we should pray as the sun is setting. At noon, we should pray when it's actually noon, not waiting half an hour or however long. However, I will mention that in ancient society, they had no such thing as minutes. They, so to them, there's no difference between 3 o'clock and 3.01 or 3.02. They, because they don't have clocks. They don't have anything like, like that. They're just going by the sun. And so when the sun, you know, it, they, they use sundials and so on, and their sundials would mark out 12 uh, divisions of the daylight period. And when it gets to the third of those 12 divisions is when they would pray. When it gets to the, you know, the middle of the noon, the, then they would have the noon prayer. When it gets to the uh, ninth hour, then they would have uh, that ninth hour prayer. So it's not necessarily down to the exact minute. It's going according to the sun. And I actually want to learn more about sundials and how to make them and so on. Uh, because that's actually how they did it. And since that's how they did it, and our Heavenly Family gave them that system, when they were keeping time like that, well, then that's how they appointed those times. But it's not that we have to go by that. We, you know, obviously on the website, the old website, we have a way to calculate out the same thing. I think something else that might be helpful, Rachel, is to just keep in mind that everything we do should be based upon true principles and heavenly principles. And if we know that the daily, the time of set aside worship time and communion time with our heavenly family uh, begins at, let's say it begins at 940, because that's about what it begins in the morning for us here, because it's not at 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. It's at the, the third and ninth hour of the natural day, which varies from season to season. So that makes it, and I'll just be frank, that makes it more difficult when you're working for someone in the world, because our times of prayer are always adjusting based on the sun, and how many hours of daylight there are because it's always divided into 12 divisions which changes on the Roman clock, you know, the clock that we have with 60 minutes 
hours and 60 second minutes, it changes where it falls on that clock. But if we know that the set aside time for worship begins at 940 in the morning and it lasts for 55 minutes, and we know that the afternoon daily starts at uh, 345 and lasts for 55 minutes, then we should be ready to meet with our Heavenly Family at the beginning of that time period, just like we should be ready to meet with them at the beginning of the start of the Sabbath at sunset, even though sunset happens at different times of the day, uh, depending on what season you're in. And, you know, so it's principle-based. If, if you know that it starts at a certain time, we should be ready to spend that amount of time with our Heavenly Family, and we can spend the time prior to the daily preparing our meal if there's anything to prepare. Um, not that it's wrong to do some food preparation during the daily, but if you leave it all for the daily time, there's very little time left for actual worship. And self-examination. And self-examination, for sure. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's good to do that, for sure, to Yeah, anything that doesn't need to be prepared right at the time, yeah, it's good to prepare it. You know, you could start half an hour before the daily, preparing your food, and then when it starts, hey, you can start with, you know, what we do is right at the beginning of the daily, we'll sing a song that draws us into self-examination, and then we'll examine ourselves for, you know, 10 minutes or so. And then after that, we will uh, read something together that's typically about the life of Christ, um, whether it's reading from the Gospels or before we were reading Desire of Ages, all these different things. And we do that for about another quarter of an hour, you know, about another 15 minutes or so. And then we pray again, interceding for people. And then after that, we eat you know, have the supper of the Lord, thank our heavenly family, and and, uh, and then at the end, discuss whatever we're reading um, together as we eat, you know, discuss the principles of truth. And then when we're done, we thank our heavenly family and sing another song. And then we go on with the business of the day. Oh, okay. Can, can I ask one more question? Sure. So when we pray, and then when I pray and I go outside, I feel like like pray. Can I say like pray under the universe? Because I'm not sure if this more like new age thing. Like I feel like the sky, the sun, and the moon, and just like part of the God's creation. So, But I don't want to feel like part of the new age Sure. No, I mean, being in nature is certainly a wonderful thing, and it's there's nothing um, wrong with going out and praying under the sky. I mean, uh, we love to pray outside and under the sky, looking up into the sky toward the north, knowing that, hey, somewhere out there in that direction is where our father and mother and brother are. Yeah, it's just not the same. I mean... It's not that you can't pray indoors. Obviously, you can. But when you're outside and you get to look, like you said, off into the horizon toward the north, you can picture more easily that, okay, somewhere beyond my scope of vision is where our our heavenly family dwell. Um, It's very nice to be out in nature and also just to recognize what God has created. Not to worship what God has created, but to acknowledge that he has created it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Another aspect that I'll mention, actually, for the benefit of everyone, in terms of the daily starting on time, I will mention that there are certainly times when righteousness demands that something be done differently. Mm -hmm. 
during the third hour or the ninth hour or one of the other times of prayer. There are times when you will find yourself in a circumstance where you have a witnessing opportunity or someone is in need of help and where you would be doing someone a disservice to end interaction with them and to go off by yourself to pray or to have the Lord's Supper or whatever the case may be. There's times when, again, righteousness demands that we may talk to someone um, on scriptural topics or whatever, witnessing to them in some way, and it cuts into the daily, perhaps even causing you to miss a whole appointed hour of prayer because of doing the work of our Heavenly Family. So, so long as the thing that you're doing is, you know, that you were sent to do it by our Heavenly Family, and they're with you doing it, and it's for the benefit of whoever it may be, that's entirely fine. That's entirely righteous. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. Um, So it's just we have the general thing that we should be doing, and the daily will take a certain form, generally speaking, but that is based off principle, not on policy. So we ought to always be able to change the form in uh, the form which our daily observance takes may change depending on circumstances. So I, I just wanted to mention that so that no one ends up um, feeling guilty, let's say, if you happen to witness to someone and it cut into the daily or whatever. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It might actually be a really good thing. Oh, I have a quick question. So like now, it's overlapping the time. Um, so we at the church and the pastor still doing sermon. It's kind of overlapped the time too with the daily hour. So is that okay to stay there or it depends on, depends on the sermon? Well, I think, it, yeah, there's, there's different circumstances with that that might come into play. Um, and I think that might depend so much depending on the person and circumstances and all that that I'll just have to say that you'd have to pray about that. You'd have to pray to find out what you should do. That's a, it's a good question, but I'll say that for... Um, my circumstances in the past, um, I would miss Sabbath school pretty well all the time, except for there were certain times of year where it didn't interfere with the daily, but I would miss Sabbath school for the sake of keeping the daily often um, when I first learned the branch message because I recognized how much it conflicted and that I couldn't actually get the daily and be at Sabbath school And when I would be there in Sabbath school during the daily, there wouldn't be benefit. Like, there wouldn't be benefit whether for me or for them. You know, it would just, uh, people weren't really interested in hearing anything and studying anything, really. It was just more so social, and I just knew that it wouldn't, it wasn't honoring or glorifying to our Heavenly Family for me to be there and that they would be far more honored and glorified for me to actually keep the daily and that would prepare me better to be able to help someone later in the day if such an opportunity could exist. And of course, everyone may have different circumstances in whatever church they're attending. It may actually be that you're attending a Sabbath school class where there are people interested in discussing truth and interested in actually, you know, delving into scripture and and investigating and that sort of thing. So, you know, what Trent is saying isn't to be taken as, okay, this is just the better way to go all the way around. It really, he really does mean that you'll have to pray about your individual circumstance because everyone's situation is going to be different enough that there's no one thing that can be said. Mm-hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Because now I've got an idea, like the personal things or um, God's guideline or principle things. Wonderful. Wonderful, amen. 
Any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a few things that I wanted to say. Sure. First of all, <laughs> I've been learning quite a bit about prayer, and I appreciate that. And second of all, I wanted to read out of Psalms 5, and it mentions both meditation and prayer. And it says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. So evidently, uh, that person is speaking this prayer. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear it in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. And second of all, I wanted to mention uh, that I believe even when we read these psalms that when David or whomever was praying, uh, weren't they singing their prayer lots of times? Yeah, I think often many of these things were sung. Yeah. Totally. And I remember... um, about someone mentioning, and I can't even remember when, but most of the time when I've prayed or watched other people pray or when you are in a group, like in a church, and and not at home by yourself, you bow your head and you fold your hands. But then they'll mention that when Christ prayed, he lifted his head to heaven and lifted his arms. So, you know, if we want God to hear us, it seems like, that we should be uh, positioning our prayers so he could hear them and not bowing our head. Amen. Amen. Ellen White says something along those lines where she says, hey, don't bury your head in your seat and, you know, where no one can hear you pray and anything like that. She says, look up, you know, speak out. That's another aspect, too, even the idea of closing our eyes you know, it's in at least in a number of places in Scripture, it talks about opening your eyes and looking up into the heavens, and like you're saying, like lifting your face up to to the sky and raising your arms, and you know, following Christ's example. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for teaching me. Well, thank you very much for mentioning this and reading from Psalm 5. That's very, very wonderful. It's one of those passages that speaks clearly on this. Um, And it mentions there about meditation as well. So I just want to mention how, you know, the meditation that it's referring to in Scripture isn't um, what we think of today as Eastern meditation or the type of thing that someone might do in whether it's yoga or whether it's um, some other sort of maybe a new age type thing. Um, But meditation in scripture is contemplation and self-examination. So technically speaking, you know, at the beginning of the daily, we meditate in that meditation being contemplation, contemplating ourselves, examining ourselves to see are we standing in the truth? Are we um, living out the life of Christ, following his example in all things? Is there anything that I have done that has fallen short? Where do I need to improve? Um, you know, what errors do I have? And, you know, asking those sorts of things to ourselves, within ourselves. And that's, that's contemplation. That's scriptural meditation. I'd like to offer some references for anyone who's interested, but I had you in mind, Carolyn, since you kind of mentioned this um, with Psalm 5 and all that. But just in case you're interested, there's a few places in Ellen White's writings um, where she mentions lifting up holy hands or lifting up hands, etc., like that. One place is in Christian Education, page 127, paragraph 2, and I'll read it real quick. I'm going to skip down, though. Um, 
Yeah, I won't read all of it. I'll just read the pertinent part. Why not pray as though you had a conscience void of offense and could come to the throne of grace in humility and yet with holy boldness, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting? And then she says, do not bow down and cover up your face as if it were something that you desired to conceal, but lift up your eyes toward the heavenly sanctuary, toward the north, where Christ, your mediator, stands before the Father to present your prayers as fragrant incense mingled with his own merit and spotless righteousness. And then, yes? Sorry, uh, as you were getting the other one, that, that reminded me of a, a place where Victor Hoddeff talks about the importance of um, having a clear vision when we are praying, a clear vision of Christ, a clear vision of the heavenly sanctuary. I forget how much detail he goes into, but he talks about how we ought to have a clear visualization or conception of those to whom we speak. And, um, yeah, I, I think that that's very important. And this statement from Ellen White just reminded me of that, you know, lifting your eyes to the heavenly sanctuary. You know, she's talking in a way that kind of assumes that we should be conceptualizing in our minds, you know, creating uh, or using our imagination for what it is there for to picture the reality that is happening that we cannot presently see. So, yeah, very interesting. Another good place is in Gospel Workers, page 254, paragraph 3. And she writes, Christ's ministers must watch unto prayer. They may come with boldness to the throne of grace, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. In faith they may supplicate the Father in heaven for wisdom and grace, that they may know how to work, how to deal with minds. And then something a little bit different, not greatly, but this is in Prophets and Kings. Page 40, paragraph 1, she's talking about Solomon. Solomon then knelt upon the platform and in the hearing of all the people offered the dedicatory prayer. Lifting his hands toward heaven while the congregation were bowed with their faces to the ground. So there you have the difference. Like we mentioned earlier, Solomon's praying, his hands are raised or his Yeah, his hands are raised toward heaven. The congregation are bowed with their faces to the ground. The king pleaded, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those are just a few, and there's more, but I'll leave it at that for now. Awesome. Thank you for reading those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, So we have been on for nearly two hours now. Um, so we should draw the meeting to a close. Does anyone have any last questions or comments? Well, real quick, um, do either of you have any comments about that last one where the congregation, uh, when someone else was praying, they they had their faces to the ground. Just curious about that. Well, it's it's just showing that when someone else is praying, then there's no like there is an example of those who aren't praying, but who are presenting themselves before the Lord, and you know, in this type of a setting, this was for the dedication of the temple. And they were prostrating themselves before God. So they're, you know, humbling themselves. They're bowed. And Solomon is representing everyone. And he's talking to God. And so he's lifting his hands and most likely looking up as well. So um, like Trent mentioned, Doug brings this out in his little study, Lifting Hands in Prayer. And how if you're all, let's say you're with a group and you're having group prayer 
and you're taking turns or whatever, going back and forth, and people are talking to our Heavenly Family, well, it's not very practical to think that everyone's going to be able to hold up their arms for the whole duration of everybody praying. And so who is appropriate for whoever is praying to lift hands um, and to look up and to be the one, you know, engaged in a conversation with her heavenly family. And so it's perfectly, um, we have the example in scripture of those who aren't doing that bowing. So it's, it's an acceptable position. It's um, totally fine when you're not the one offering the prayer. Absolutely. And there may be times when it's appropriate to totally prostrate yourself, depending, you know. Yeah, that's, that's a scriptural posture of prayer. There's kneeling. There are a couple times where it shows standing. Um, yeah, standing, kneeling, and prostrating are all uh, acceptable postures in prayer. Although, again, it's very few times with standing, and there was a time, for instance, uh, I think a, a guy had got up to preach, and oh, yeah. Ellen White strongly rebuked him before everyone and basically said, you know, where do you get the idea that you should just stand up there? Get on your yeah, knees. Yeah, and she said, get on your knees and, you yeah. know, pray to God. and Humble yourself, in other words. Um, so that's, I mean... And of course, well, at times of prayer, we kneel down before our Heavenly Family and pray to them. And I think that that's what we should really be doing. And yes, there are uh, times where it will be otherwise. There's going to be times when a person can't kneel because of injury. Oh, yeah. And, you know, these are just real circumstances, real interaction with, with real beings. And we should be keeping all that in mind. It's not, you know, we can't do it based on formula. Totally. That particular uh, verse, in the first place, I got the impression that that you know that was a special occasion. That's a very serious occasion, and that might explain why they were why they were prostrating themselves on the ground. I doubt that every time someone prayed, they were on the ground with their faces to the ground, or however they were doing it with their faces to the ground. That could just be that their heads were bowed. Quite frankly, but. Um, we see a lot of pictures where people are just stretched out flat. But I just, um, getting back to the text, I just thought it was a special occasion and very serious, um, very serious one. So that's why I assumed that that's why they were prostrate. Uh, actually, yeah, I'll, to expand on that a little bit, you know, this is the dedication of the temple, and the Shekinah is going to enter into the temple, and so they are humbling themselves, and the Shekinah is about to manifest and to enter the temple, and they aren't about to look straight at her. Um, and when she does enter the temple, if I'm remembering correctly, it's very interesting that Solomon then prays toward the temple. You know, prior, he's lifting his hands to heaven, praying toward heaven, and then he prays toward the temple. Why? Because the Shekinah has entered the temple. So, yeah, very, very interesting. All right, are there any uh, last comments and questions? I'll make one more comment. Um, just thought, hmm, someone might wonder about this, so I'll mention it. You know, if you're going throughout the day and you're just talking to our Heavenly Family, or even just a particular member of our Heavenly Family, uh, you can do that without stopping and turning to face north. And you can even do that without getting on your knees. If you, you know what I mean? There's like, if you're just going about your business and you just want to talk and speak and share something with our Heavenly Family, that's totally appropriate, too. Totally. You know, if there's times where you're out there, you're working, you're shoveling dirt or cutting trees or whatever you're doing, you know, it's certainly right to talk to our Heavenly Family and you shouldn't um, allow what you're doing to restrict you from doing so. 
Amen. I have a question. All right. Yeah, sure. You think someday we will see God because it says that if we have pure in heart and we can see God's face. So can we really see the Holy Spirit like in physical being? Yeah, absolutely. There will come a day where we will physically see with our actual eyes the members of our Heavenly Family. Yes. <laughs> and that's that verse that you mentioned is one of them that shows that. There are actually many more verses that show that same thing, uh, that describe people in the past seeing members of the Godhead, and there are also verses which say that we will see God and other members of the Godhead. I missed the verse. What was the verse? Uh, where it says the pure in heart shall okay. see God yes. in the Beatitudes. Okay. So before we get to the heaven, right, we'll be in the in the earth. Yes. Well, yes, there's, we won't necessarily see the father by, you know, while we're still on earth or the mother. I don't know of anything that indicates that. And I don't know of anything that indicates that we will see the Son before the second coming, but we will see him at the second coming. But there are verses which do say that we will see our sister, the Shekinah, um, prior to the second coming, and even prior to the full establishment of the kingdom in the land of Israel. So I won't go through all the verses right now, but... She will be visibly here among us. Um, Ezekiel 43 talks about her entering the temple. One of the passages that talks about um, seeing her and having uh, you know, a face-to-face experience, I believe it's in Ezekiel 20. Let me just double-check that. Yeah, Ezekiel, tw- Ezekiel 20, uh, verse 35 Yahweh is speaking and and says, I will bring you into the wilderness of the people um, and there will I plead with you face to face. And like it goes on, it says, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. So there, it says that um, Moses spoke to God face to face and it says that the same thing will happen here in the wilderness prior before Trent, entering into the land of promise. Trent, did you say that before we go to the kingdom? This is prior to the complete establishment of the premillennial kingdom in the land of Israel. Okay. Is Ontario also part of the kingdom too? Or just the headquarter, I, can, I should say. Yeah, Ontario, uh, what we have here, this is a place that our Heavenly Family has blessed us with at the present time to accomplish the present phase of the work. But it's not um, the kingdom as it will be in the Promised Land. You know, I mean, it is very, very different. Right now, this is still under the provincial government of Ontario, under the federal government of Canada. It is not a um, nation of its own. You know, this is the land that we have here isn't an independent nation or anything like that. It's just a place that we have where our Heavenly Family has blessed us with it in order to get things done. And thankfully, it is one of the few places in North America that has such a high degree of freedom. We are able to do so much here that, you know, the day-to-day life isn't really uh, restricted by the different regulations and laws of the, of the land. Um, but it's not, you know, this isn't by any means the promised land um, in any other sense than the rest of the world is. But... Yeah, so when we get to the land of Israel, that will be a a different scenario where our Heavenly Family will be setting up an independent 
government that will not be under the yoke of any other power and will have a separate economy, separate uh, laws and everything from the other nations. So that's something that we certainly look forward to. And our Heavenly Family is wanting us to move more so to living how we will live in the Promised Land and understanding what that will be like. So at this property, things will be as much as possible um, operating theocratically, a, a theocratic government. So it's the laws of our heavenly family. Um, but again, it's just it's not the full setup of things. Will the Ontario property be considered the wilderness then? Well, the lands of the Gentiles are certainly the wilderness, and this is part of the lands of the Gentiles. So, but it's not that it is the wilderness, you know, spoken of in this verse or anything like that. It's um, not the wilderness where we would see the sister then. Well, I don't know where exactly that will be um, other than on the other side of Jordan near Mount Nebo. <laughs> That's one place where it will be. and Because that's where the Ark of the Covenant was hid, and that's where it will be brought out from. Yes, and that's when it says that the Shekinah, the glory, will be seen at that point. There's specific prophecies that pinpoint that, uh, that place, that um, time, at least in the series of events, when that will take place. And I don't know of anything that would imply that she will be seen visibly, you know, here <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, you know, I mean, who knows? I can't say, I can't restrict what our Heavenly Family is going to do, but I just want it to be clear that I'm not making any claims that something like that would happen or will happen um, because I don't know of anything from our Heavenly Family which would indicate that. Okay, thank you. But I will say, I will say though, that in the past, our Heavenly Family has providentially um, chosen certain places for their people to be with specific names. Um, the Nazarenes, as, as we've learned, and we haven't gone through this in great detail in the past, but at some point we may talk about it more, but as everyone here knows, the early followers of Christ were called Nazarenes, which is an anglicized form of a Hebrew word, Netzarim, which means branches. And the Nazarenes were practicing Judaism and believing in Christ. They weren't departing to another religion, just like Christ and the apostles never departed to another religion. Christianity, as we think of Christianity, didn't actually begin until the second century, and it was a guy named Ignatius that coined the term um, and said it in opposition to Judaism. The Nazarenes, though, um, were the original followers of Christ. They continued to keep the Sabbath. They continued to keep the feast days. The gospel that they read was written in Hebrew and specifically records Christ referring to the Holy Spirit as his mother, and it specifically records the Holy Spirit referring to Christ as her son, all these different things. Um, it's known as the gospel according to the Hebrews or the Hebrew gospel. Those were the original followers of Christ. That was the true movement, not the Christianity of the second, third, fourth century going on with the church fathers and so on. Um, the Nazarenes are traceable in history up until somewhere around the 5th century. After that, they're kind of lost to history, at least at the present time. There may be more information that is revealed later, but at the present time, they're only traceable up until, you know, the 5th century or so, and which is the 400s. And um, it's interesting how the Nazarenes 
in the history that we do have of them, throughout the first uh, few centuries of the Common Era, is that they traveled to different places. And the places where Nazarene communities were established were, interestingly enough, all places with significant names. So um, they would go to one place and it would have a name that actually uh, is a, a messianic title, like a, a title for the Messiah, uh, like the star or something like that. And then they would travel somewhere else and they would end up settling somewhere else where it had a significant uh, symbolic name. This took place in the history of the Nazarenes. I also find it interesting that that took place uh, in the history of the branch. Well, when the branch uh, Davidians or some of the branch Davidians went to Israel in the late 50s, they went to a place uh, which the name of it meant twigs. And it was Amorim. And that's, they went there um, and they were confirmed that, oh, this is the place because of its prophetic name, Twigs. Um, this was just after the branches had had a revelation to them of the prophecy of Ezekiel 17, which talks about twigs being planted in the land of Israel as being like the, the, um, the little bud of the kingdom. And so that, you know, was a prophetically significant name. I do find it interesting how the place that our Heavenly Family has blessed us with now in Ontario is in a place called Way. It's, it's, uh, this property is located outside of the borders of Hearst, outside of, you know, all these other places, and it's an unorganized township that is called Way. And that's, it's quite interesting because the early movement of Christ were called those of the way. They were called, you know, way was a very significant thing for them, uh, just as it was for the Qumran community. And so here, you know, and it, it says, prepare ye the way in the wilderness. That's what John the Baptist and the Qumran community um, based their understanding of the way uh, off of that. So that's uh, interesting to is one way to put it, I guess. That this is where our Heavenly Family has put us in the township of Way. Oh, so do you think we may have a new Hebrew name in the future when we go to the um, kingdom? Or, I mean, the, in the earthly kingdom? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I can't say one way or the other for sure. I mean, there's one verse in Revelation which talks about uh, a white stone with a new name written on it. But in the context, it's talking about the new name of Christ, not talking about new names that each of us would receive. Um, so I actually don't know of any scripture which talks about all of us as individuals receiving new names. There are verses that record individuals having received new names in the past, and it's you know certainly possible that at least some of us will receive new names, and maybe all of us, but I just don't know. I don't know of any scripture that says anything like that, so I couldn't say. Well, I'm remembering that um, vision that you wrote about in one of the trumpets, mm -hmm. where um, they were actually, weren't they actually unloading the sanctuary there on the property or can you refresh our memories on that? Uh, that's a fair description but I, I won't go into it all right now just for sake of time but I'll, I'll just encourage everyone if you wanted to read uh, that dream it is in the silver trumpet I, let me just see if I can find the issue um, I think it's in Volume 1, Numbers 5 to 7. That's what I was thinking, too. Because yeah, that's, like that's what made me think that that might be considered the wilderness, the beginning of the infant uh, infant kingdom. You know, I, I just wondered if, because the Shekinah is actually 
dwelling near you, isn't she? Okay, here's, here's the thing. What we're told is that the kingdom sprouts in the wilderness. The wilderness is the lands of the Gentiles, so it could be anywhere in the lands of the Gentiles. It's not like some particular place is the wilderness and that's where it has to be. It's the lands of the Gentiles. It's a very broad idea. And our Heavenly Family has revealed to us that our sister is traveling from point to point among those who hear the message. And she's, this is revealed in Zechariah 5, Um, and in the Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Numbers 15 and 16, she's going from place to place in order to destroy the houses, so to speak, of those who are hearing the message and invite them to come and join her temple. Um, So she's certainly doing that. She's on a traveling throne, as revealed in Ezekiel, presumably because she travels. <laughs> um, and beyond that, I mean, yes, it does, our Heavenly Family did uh, show us by means of this dream, which, by the way, is actually recorded in the Silver Trumpet, uh, Volume 1, Numbers 5 to 7. And the section where it is recorded starts on page Uh, 44 at the bottom of the page it's a section called looking ahead and then it goes up till that section let's see goes to the end of page 47 Um, so there's there's a dream that they show us in which hey yes they have appointed this place to be uh, a place where the sanctuary work is done where there's some work of the sanctuary that is done here and we are to seek to understand more of what that means and thankfully we are coming to understand more of what that means but there's a lot more to learn um, so surely yes our sister is spending time here but it's not to say that she's restricted to this particular location so you saying the sister is coming to my place to destroy, so I'm moving to Ontario? <laughs> <laughs> well, if our Heavenly Family, uh, if it is their will for you to come here for how, whatever length of time, then, then that will be great. Um, not but everyone. What we'll say is that, you know, yeah, it's, it's not the case that, every, that everyone should come here. And even those, many who should come here, it will only be a temporary thing. Um, But here's here's the thing. Um, When it says that she's going to destroy our houses, it's talking about our carnal security. It's not to say that the physical dwelling that we live in will be destroyed, although it's certainly possible if that's what it takes, but that's not the, the point of the verse. But it is saying that if we don't want our, um, basically we have have a couple options. She's coming around and she's going to be destroying our carnal security, which what I mean by that is the things of the world that cause us to feel comfortable and secure and all these things, whether it's financial, whether it's um, having a roof over our head, whatever it may be, whatever we hold on to that keeps us from giving all for the sake of our Heavenly Family, she's going around to destroy that. And if we are okay with that, if we're willing to let go of all that, then we can just let go and we won't be negatively impacted by our carnal security being destroyed because we wouldn't be placing our trust in that. We will be placing our trust in our Heavenly Family and saying, no, I'm not going to build my own house. I'm going to build the temple. And when we take that approach, then wherever we may be, whether in California or Missouri or Washington or Michigan or wherever we may be, anywhere in the world, so long as we are seeking the building of our Heavenly Family's kingdom rather than building up our own livelihood, uh, then our Heavenly Family can take care of us. 
But if we refuse their command to build the temple and instead go on building our own livelihood, then our livelihood will be destroyed and we will be left with nothing because we won't have chosen the place where there is true security, and that's in the arms of heaven. Okay. Well, I'm still making money. That means, am I staying in here or? Well, here's the thing. What you do in your, in your particular situation, how this applies, will depend on what our Heavenly Family has called you to do. So what, what you need to make as your priority is to seek our Heavenly Family with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole being, and to obey whatever instructions they give you. You know, whatever they give you, whatever instruction you have from them today, do that today. And that will end up changing your circumstances because you will choose to follow their will to whatever your circumstances are supposed to be. You know, I don't know exactly what our Heavenly Family has called you to do. So I couldn't say, you know, where exactly you're supposed to be, what circumstances you're supposed to be in, in terms of work or this or that. But I can say that our Heavenly Family calls us to separate from the world, which may take different forms for different people, but we are to separate from the world. We are to separate from everything that would hinder our obedience to their laws. And we should seek them to know what they have called us to do as individuals. So I should be seeking them, what should I do? And just each day, whatever they've given you to do, do that. If there's something that you don't know yet, you know, you've asked them, oh, what should I do with this? And if, if you don't know yet, if they haven't given you an answer yet, then just do the things that they have given you. So they've told you, just to mention a few things, they told you to study their word, to investigate the message, and to share the message, to focus on justification by faith, to examine yourself, to worship them at their appointed hours, at their appointed times, to talk to them, to pray to them, to spend time with them. So all those things that they've given you to do, do those things. And don't let anything prevent you from doing those things. If anything stands in your way, from doing what our Heavenly Family has given you to do, then cut those things out. You know, this is kind of like what, what Christ was talking about where he says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. You know, anything that causes you to sin, remove it from your life. And just determine in your mind that you will follow our Heavenly Family in all things. And as you follow them, in the little things, that's being faithful in the little things, then they will give you more. They will reveal more to you as to what you need to do in other circumstances. So that's, that's really all that all of us are supposed to do. Okay, thanks. I'm not going to ask any more questions now. <laughs> <laughs> well, They've I, been good ones. They have been good, and I will say that our Heavenly Family is delighted with your questions and the fact that you are asking them. Yes. It doesn't tire them to hear you ask questions, nor does it tire me or hopefully none of the rest of us. Any of you guys getting tired out there? <laughs> you need to change your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's a good thing to ask our Heavenly Family and to seek our Heavenly Family on these points, to be seeking the truth and we should be looking for answers. So it's a good thing. All right. Well, I guess if there aren't any more questions or comments, we should close off. Uh, we never want to restrict anyone. So if there's anything else from anyone, please feel free to voice it and say that you have something to say or something to ask. And otherwise, um, I'll ask if there's anyone who would like to volunteer to close us off with prayer or with talking to our Heavenly Family, perhaps, I should say. No, Bert. You can hear Wonderful. me. Wonderful. 
Dear Heavenly Family, we thank you that your daughter comes to us every morning, by morning, to teach us, along with it, all the other appointed times, too, through your, through her angel messenger. We thank you for this very enlightening time together tonight. We praise you and we thank you. Help us to praise you more and more. For praise is comely. We need your wisdom so much. We thank you for tonight's study in the name of your son and daughter, the branch, he and she. Amen. 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 Thank you, Heavenly Family. Well, I have to say, I have been blessed tonight. Me too. And I've really enjoyed Amen. hearing you guys and, it, you know, interacting with you guys. And, and I'll have to say that I'm, I especially enjoyed the questions. Be, partly because of the nature of the questions. These are very appropriate times to be asking practical things like this. Mm -hmm. If anyone doesn't understand how to observe some point of truth or how to understand some point of truth, then the only good thing to do is to ask or to seek the answer. And, you know, there's different ways to seek the answer, of course. You don't have to ask Trent everything or even ask another person anything. You can go straight to Scripture, ask for Heavenly Family. But this is one of the means that can be utilized, and it's a very good means. And so, um, yeah, I was especially blessed by these questions tonight because I see it um, manifesting what is in the heart of people they're wanting to really understand how to please their heavenly family and how to um, be obedient. You know, what does it mean to be obedient in these things? How, you know, to understand the will of our heavenly family. So I'm really, really grateful for that. And thank Amen. you, heavenly family, for stirring people up to ask these questions. And to make these comments. Amen. Amen. So may you all be blessed as you are from heaven. Amen. And we'll see you on the social meeting tomorrow, Lord's willing. Amen. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Love you all.